So Ted, I popped a, a good chunk of the last presentation. A great stuff. This one's going to be probably a little bit more academic, which I apologize for in advance, but uh, we'll give you some background on the evaluation process and, and kind of what we do and why we do it. Okay, this is our disclaimer. Um, Mark and these are not Mark and the Kings, the Steve and Kings, Lawrence, Gary, and myself. Uh, like my dad used to say, the Arkansas guarantee is great from now. You will both have. Uh, don't take anything we say as advice or guidance. Uh, let's talk to us separately later. Uh, that's Gary, who looks just like that, and I was going to take all of that Apologies for that. Uh, learning objectives really basically to understand concepts and um, it gives you some familiarity with kind of what we do and why we do it. Uh, recognize some of the methods, identify some of the long term uh, normalize adjustments that we normally go through, and how to kind of reconcile these methods when we say. So, yeah. um, again, evaluation basis. There are really three approaches to value for anything, whether it's your watch or your house or your business. Uh, we have an asset approach, which is really you know, if you mark everything on the company so it's a fair value or fair market value, what is the sum of those assets look like? That can be challenging in the startup environment. Uh, intangible assets we develop, they're not easy to identify as value. <laughs> Uh, next approach, probably the primary approach for folks, is the income approach. Uh, typically, it's kind of cash flow model. You take into consideration. Um, I got an echo. I apologize for folks on the An income approach with a forecast of future operations, what we anticipate to occur. Uh, perhaps we do some probability weighting for anticipated trends that are uncertain, um, and try to develop the cost of capital to bring all of that. And finally, the market approach. If we can find sales of similar comparable assets or companies, uh, make some adjustments for normalization of earnings, growth, risk, uh, we can get multiples that make some sense and apply those to whatever statistic is relevant to the industry and develop another solution. And then we've listed rules of thumb up here. They're, these are all of the uh, you know, construction companies you talk about, book value of assets plus backlog and rule of thumb. Or dental practices have their own rules, but on technology companies, uh, these are developed over time. People sort of do, you know, they, they tell war stories and deals that happen and, and get things where they, they think they make some sense. Uh, we try not to use them uh, because they, they can lead you in a bad direction when you shift in the market, shift in the information. And then finally, we'll talk about discounts and adjustments we make to, to reflect control and certainly to reflect marketability. Um, evaluation basis. Value is an interesting word. In our in our evaluation practice, in the litigation practice, uh, we have different standards and, and different levels. The, the basic primary one is fair market value. It was initially published and codified in the Internal Revenue uh, Ruling 59-60, so as you can tell, it's, it's pretty old. Uh, it is the, the, the price a willing buyer and a willing seller for the breach deal that both have reasonable knowledge of all of the facts. At a certain data and that's then the standard. Fair value, and I have fair value there twice for a reason. Fair value is a litigation construct on one sense, where you have different states and jurisdictions, and Gary's much more familiar with that. Um, and he's raising his hand. Can you hear me, Gary? Yeah. Out someplace. Um, so you know, you're, you're told when you sell your house, you get the debt and the equity value that pay off with the bank. Uh, your furnishings are separate, and you take those with me, so that kind of gives you a visual on what, uh, what those are like. So again, so two things that are really important in this process is evaluation data. You know, evaluation standards limit us to what is known or knowable at the evaluation standard. And I, I'll tell you, the total screen is a real interesting world for us, and still does. If our evaluation date is, is 2017 and 2018, COVID, who knew what COVID was? But yes, it obviously occurred, it impacted many businesses, it impacted many people's lives. And so, you know, to do evaluation assignment and be blind to things you know that happened is it, difficult, but it's frequently relevant. But similarly, the purpose of the engagement. Now, it's important to identify whether or not it's litigation versus tax reporting versus financial reporting versus investment decisions. Because those, as we talked earlier, they all three at a different level. That we want to get a number to. And those numbers can be different based upon your input. 
and our evaluation of approaches. I think I handed off to Joe. Great, thanks, Tim. I appreciate that. So there are there are a number of different valuation approaches. Uh, there's what's known as the asset approach, where you look at the assets of the company. There's the income approach, where you look at the income of the company. And there's two different ways that you could do that. You could either capitalize the historical earnings of a company based upon the history that's occurred of the company, or you could discount the future cash flows of the company. Now, how many of you have been involved in startups? Which way do you typically go with the startup? Income, uh, capitalization of historical? We're hoping that you're going to, well, if you're buying it, you go with the capitalization of historical, right? But if, you, if you're looking to sell it, you're going to be based upon the discount of the future cash flow, right? So it really depends upon which hat you're wearing or where you're sitting in it. And then there's some rules of thumb. And then we have the final one, which is the market approach. And the market approach is comparing your company or the company that target company to other companies within the industry. And there's a number of different authoritative literature and uh, databases out there that we use with various multiples. And we're gonna talk about that as we get into the rules of thumb. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so the under the asset approach, it's the adjusted net asset method. So basically you look at the assets and compare them to the fair market value and the as liabilities and compare them to the fair market value. Now, one more story that I had is one time when I was valuing a dozen funeral homes because the, the gentleman passed away and believe it or not, he was such a nice guy. He left it to his ex-wife and his children. So the, the good news was that he made investments in various real estate when he built these funeral homes. Each time he wanted to open a funeral home, what did he do? He bought an old Victorian house and that Victorian house served as the funeral home. Now, each funeral home was losing money, but unfortunately, because he got bad tax advice when he was setting this up, he came to us after the fact each of the, uh, the, all of those houses were owned within the entity that had the shares in the funeral homes. So as my grandmother used to say, the funeral homes were making bupkis, but each of those houses, even though he bought them for $200,000, was worth in excess of $3.5 million. Now the question is, does anybody really want to live in a house that was a funeral home? That I'll let you decide. <laughs> but with that being said, the value of his estate was tremendous because he had these six houses that were each worth in excess of three to four million dollars, even though the funeral home he couldn't make a go of it. And that's probably one of the reasons he got divorced in the first place. But I'm not getting into politics. <laughs> All right. Uh, the pros and cons provides the floor value of the company, and it's a relatively simple analysis when you do the asset approach. The cons, it's really not indicative of the healthy business or an unhealthy business because you're just looking at the assets that are there. You're essentially, for all intents and purposes, adjusting the assets to the fair market value and stripping out any of the attributes associated with the operating business. And I, I excuse, apologize for the echo, but that's the only way that everybody online can hear this. All right. So if my wife was here, she'd say, God damn it, I have to listen to you twice. But anyhow, <laughs> it may be, may be necessary also to adjust the fair market value of those assets and get appraisals on some of those assets, whether it's fixed assets, whether it's uh, whether it's tangible personal property, whether it's real property, you might have to get appraisals in order to support your position when you do use the asset approach. All right, next next slide. The next slide is the income approach. And again, as I talked about here, we can either discount the future cash flows or we could do a capitalization of the historical earnings of the company. Okay, so those are the two basic ways in which you do it. What you have to do though, is you have to determine a proper income stream of the company. And you have to do adjust it for certain cash flow adjustments, things that get added back or things like depreciation. And then, we're going to talk about it in a moment, but I'm gonna I'm gonna mention a curse word. I apologize for that, but it's called normalization. And you're gonna see why I call it a curse word in a minute. All right. We have to determine what the discount or capitalization rate is. How do you determine what the discount or capitalization rate is? It really depends upon the operations of the business, it depends upon the risk, and it depends upon the specific risk premium of that particular company. And we've seen two companies operating in the same world, but having different cap rates because of management, because of location, because of competition, 
and other attributes associated with that particular valuation. And that's an important thing to, think, to understand also. Evaluation is done for a specific purpose. I testified one time successfully as an expert witness in a matter where a gentleman was looking to get bought out of a business, but he was using the wrong valuation. He happened to have been using that valuation that was done previously for his divorce. If, if you're using an investment, if you're investing money in a transaction and you do a discount of cash flow, I assume you're going to use the discount rate that you want, the return that you want being the discount rate on that transaction. If it doesn't meet that criteria, then you don't invest. Correct. Correct. That is correct. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. yeah you, what you do is you you have your, you you as an investor have your own risk tolerance, but we as a, we as valuation specialists are going to come up with our own discount rate and own capitalization rate, and they may or may not meet because you might have a different you know for example your your acquisition might be for strategic purposes, where somebody else's acquisition might be because they want to buy the competition out or because they see a way in which to build their business and bolt on. And, you know, what was the name? Uh, chain, what was, what's the guy? Help, help me out here. Black Decker. What's the name? The Chainsaw guy. He used oh, to, Dunlap. Al Dunlap. Al Dunlap. He used to buy, right? Sorry, I'm cursing again. He used to buy companies and then what? He used to cut out all the fat in the companies. You know, I mean, same type of thing. What you've got to do is you got to look. It's it's really the before and after method for all intents and purposes. Um, so the, the pros are provides the most company specific value because you're dealing with something that's there. It's, it's income. It's something you could not, not that you could feel and touch, but it, 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 it's indicative of, you know, they always say, you know, past performance is not indicative of future results. Well, you know what, when you buy the company, you better help, better hope is held that the past performance is indicative of future results. And then it could pro approximate basically the projected growth of the business, depending upon, as I said, competition, strategic, areas, supply chain, and other attributes. Um, this is where I, I'm going to curse again, so I apologize, the normalizing adjustments. Those of you that have gone into any closely held business, and believe it or not, some of the large businesses, I'm not going to bring up a company named Tyco, but any large business also, where the, the, where the chairman or some of the executives believe that it was their own personal piggy bank. So some of the things that we have to do is normalizing the income of a company compensation do they have family members on their payroll is the uh, uh, uh is the great aunt once removed a, a member of the board or is her niece or nephew of that great aunt once removed getting compensation uh our offers just paid something other than fair market value we've been involved in companies where the individual that's there is pulling down great numbers males females and even young entrepreneurs but if you were to go out and replace that person, would you have to pay that person that much money in order to run the company on a productive basis? Probably not. So what we do is we normalize things like the fair market value of the company. Personal expenses. I was involved in litigation because some of my areas not only get involved in this type of work, quality of earnings, post-purchase price adjustments, other areas, but I also get involved in large matrimonial matters. And I had one matrimonial uh, matter, believe it or not, where the two brothers were married to sisters. So they were all, as 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 we say in the in the homeland, mushbucha. All right. So they're uh, they're all family members. Well, what what the, what what would happen is is that the two brothers were cheating on the two wives, even though they were sisters. So what they did is, even though their business was was in New York City, they had two condos down at the Jersey Shore in Atlantic City. And who was paying for the business? Who was paying for those condos down at the Jersey Shore? Raise your hand if you know the answer. <laughs> the business. All right. So we added that back to the back to uh, back as a as a your business. All right. <laughs> I swear to you. I swear to you. And despite themselves, they still made money. All right. <laughs> what the heck? You might have some other related party transactions. So what what might happen is that you might be selling to another company that might be a wholly owned subsidiary of yours. So what we've got to do is we've got to make, have to adjust those sales or you might have to adjust the cost of those product going out. So your sales might be overstated or your cost of goods sold might be overstated or understated, but we got to take a deep, hard look. You know, it was mentioned a few minutes ago about due diligence. 
we do all, we do our due diligence when we go through the process. Sorry, we do our due diligence. I want to see if you're paying attention as we go through the process. You got a couple of minutes here. Yep, non-operating income or expenses get get, get added back. Uh, non-recurring income, uh, extraordinary items, and expense trends. We look at the expense trends and compare them to others in the industry. So if you if you have 16 cars on the business and you're really not a delivery company, you'd be sure as hell that we're going to add it back. Next slide, Tim. All right, market approach is basically looking at other companies within the industry. How do other companies fare compared to you? We look at multiples. We look at attributes associated. We look at the size. And that's one of the things. And one, one thing I might point out, if a valuation analyst is doing their work, they're going to look at all three approaches and have to explain why they discounted or did not use one of those three approaches. Oftentimes, market approach is not used probably the most because it's most dissimilar to the company that the thing is evaluated. And market approach is typically only used in areas where there's high assets, such as real estate or other, other items that have a, a large value. Um, let's go to the next slide because we are running deer on time. All right, the market approach pros incorporates market conditions and prices paid in recent relative transactions. It's easy to explain and apply. Why is it easy? Because you look at company A as compared to company B, it's got a multiple of X and you go home. All right, the cons, it can be misleading if debt's not appropriately considered. The company loads itself up on debt, takes a poison pill. We got to really take a look at that. In certain industries, there may be a lack of lack of comparable or public transactions that companies could uh, uh, compare it to. Next slide, please. Rules of thumb. Tim, I'm going to throw it back to you because I was talking about rules of thumb when I talked about the com uh, comparable companies. But let's have you talk more about the rules of thumb. Just speak up a little more, Tim. Can't can't hear you as well. Maybe come closer to the phone. Like a microphone. Okay, um, good. Better. A book published by Dustin or uh, Glenn Dustin in the 70s that was a rule of thumb. It went industry by industry and laid them out. And folks have tried to use that as, as you know primary evidence of value. Uh, it's it, it really it is it's it's a sense of value for an industry. It gives you an idea. <clears throat> so if you're talking about a dental practice, you have you have number of active patients and a thousand patients or something. Uh, and it, it'll, it'll give you a range, but it doesn't account for too many things. It doesn't account for profitability. If you're, you know, more profitable or less profitable, you should be worth more or less. It doesn't account for risk. Uh, if you are more risky, obviously, you're worth less and vice versa. So it, it, for many folks, it's a starting place. And the ability to reconcile a valuation conclusion that's appropriately prepared back to that rule of thumb construct is important because it helps the business owner who is not a valuation person understand kind of where they are relative to the market. But that really is, it, it, it can produce misleading results and it isn't acceptable anywhere. We, we are forced to submit our work. Great, thanks, Tim. Okay. Next can slide. Can a question? Sure. One of the, the parts um, in intellectual property is really mainly, um, do you guys get into the valuation of the intellectual property and which is an intangible asset or given? Yes, we do, we do value IP. In fact, we're doing work in an IP area as we speak. So yes, uh, control consideration, something to think about also, uh, you know, Tim, you could take it or I could take it, but there are, there are always discounts and controls, discounts that are taken into consideration or premiums that are taken into consideration. So let's say you're doing a strategic acquisition and that 2% of the company that you're buying is going to give you a 51% control in the company. Much better, right? That if you have a 49% versus a 51%. So there are a lot of things that you have to consider when you're doing those uh, controlled, uh, those controlled discounts or control premiums, okay, um, and there are various adjustments that are supporting those. There's uh, mer uh, merger stats. Got Tim. Yeah, one other thing to consider. We talked about normalization. One of the first ones that you throw out there, but it's important to understand if you don't both have control, those normalizing adjustments may not be able to happen. So if you go through that, that process and that effort to develop a value conclusion of the whole business and a whole slew of normalizing you know, adjustments in there, that incremental value may not be able to be realized. So it's important to recognize where you're starting. If it's a 10% interest with no contractual ability to control the business, you're stuck with whatever the owner does. 
Um, so it, you know, understanding that you don't want to get into a position where you have to add it back and then take it back out again. And you, you end up doing you know multiple levels of math that aren't necessary. Right, which goes with the golden rule, right? Who has the gold rules? So it, 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 that that's in evaluation. That's always, always, always a sticking point. Next slide. Gary. Yep. One minute. Yep, we're wrapping up. Next slide. And this is our last slide, I believe, is the post-purchase price adjustments. How many of you have been involved in transactions that you do an earn out where you have criteria that people write? And no matter what happens to the value of the company when you buy it, there's always a post-purchase price adjustment. I'm, I've been involved in six of these in the last year, from here to Omaha, to Kentucky, to California. Uh, and once the deal is established, it's memorialized in an agreement. But that agreement is only as good as the paper it's written on because why? There's milestones. Somebody might look at working capital in one way, you might look in another way. Everybody knows working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. But what's deemed to be a current asset versus a current liability for evaluation? There's performance milestones, there's revenues, there's profit margins. How do you control the expenses of the business once you earn you once you own it? There are earnouts that go back to the former members, shareholders, or partners that are in the business. And there's other contingent considerations or events that might come about that you could not even foresee at the time in which this agreement was memorialized. So we do get involved in post-purchase price adjustments here. It's a big part of what we do. Um, but we also stand by the valuations that we sign. Um, and we've testified in courts as well as uh, our, at arbitrations and mediations. So I think the last slide is for questions. Uh, Marty, I feel Marty's eyes in the back of my head. I'm going to take two quick questions. So, <laughs> right, quickly, uh, you know, I actually met a company yesterday worth seven million. Uh, it's a medical device company doing you know, blood testing. He has some patents, and uh, actually asked her what's some P money, post money valuation. Mm -hmm. You know, and she didn't know what I was asking. Oh. <laughs> However, one of the things that stood out in my mind. You were talking about market pricing uh, that Abbott had already given her an offer to buy the company, right? Right. How much of a factor is that? Now, she has no traction, right? No sales. So she feels that if she had traction, the valuation would go up. What is your opinion on that? It probably would go up because then what we would do is we'd have a we would have income and, and we could know what a better profit margin is. Right now, what she has is she has the patents and she has essentially a company that's looking to purchase those patents because they, they don't want to go through the technology or approval phases. So I, chances are, if she's going to get traction going forward, I think that if you were to come back to her, in my personal opinion, Tim, you tell me if you're wrong, but I think if you were to come back to her and she were to have sales booked and, and, and order shipping, I think the, the price tag for that number, even though she doesn't know what her company is worth today, will be significantly higher down the road. Well, isn't it like a dog chasing its own tail? She needs the seven million to get traction. Right. It is a circular equation, but maybe she'll go to Abbott and say, you know what, you know what, you know, maybe you're interested in making a smaller investment in me, giving up less of a percentage than something like that you're offering. So it's a negotiating, it's a chess game. It's a, just make sure that, you know, she's not playing, you know, you're not playing one game and she's playing another. Last question? Yes, sir. Steve Katz. You know, many times in a situation like that, the buyer has a strategic motive. Mm -hmm. And if the buyer has a strategic motive, Correct. it's an Abbott. If they recognize the technology base or the capabilities or the IP or the potential position of the technology in the, in the hands of one investor or a strategic partner, that technology is very valuable. So Abbott, whether the sales or not, they have a, a clear picture that this is worth a lot of money because of IP, positioning, product design, et cetera. And there may be a different valuation for a a strictly financial buyer. And I think, I don't know if you commented on financial buyers and strategic buyers before I had to step out to take a call, but- I did, I waited till you stepped out. Yeah, there's, there's, there's <laughs> <a fight. laughs> I waited till you stepped out. <laughs> we, we have a strategic buyer in different situations. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Because we, you, you, you're right, when we did cover seat, but you're, you hit the nail on the head. That's what I'm saying. I've been buying because for, for, for a reason, but once you get those sales going up, you know, it could be a whole different ball game. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you very Good much. Job. And th thank you for thank you for getting up at the crack of dawn in California. <laughs> <laughs>